I'm Barbara Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Heritage North Carolina, I'm going to give you a little tour today of sites and places in Raleigh that were important to the development of the Jewish community here. For the most part, the Jews of Raleigh were owners or operators of small retail businesses. In the earliest days, there were peddlers, butcher shops, a dairy, and grocery stores. There were a number of musicians. Then came shoe stores, clothing stores, jewelry stores, furniture stores, pawn shops, junk dealers, manufacturers, representatives, salesmen. There were one or two lawyers, no doctors for many years. Since Raleigh was a government and university town, there was no one predominant industry like textiles in Greensboro or tobacco in Winston-Salem. Farmers from the rural eastern towns came to Raleigh to shop, but they had to travel to different towns to sell their tobacco since there was no tobacco market in Raleigh. Nobody made a lot of money, and there wasn't a big difference between the poorest people and the most well-to-do. During the Depression, some businesses failed, and some people lost their houses. There were community-wide Jewish organizations like B'nai B'rith and the YMHA. Many Jewish men chose to join the Masons, and women volunteered with the American Red Cross and the USO. Young men went to UNC in Chapel Hill or State College in Raleigh. A few Jewish girls attended Meredith College. A statewide, very active youth organization held social events so that Jewish young people could meet their peers from across the state. Jewish men from Raleigh served in the armed services in both World War I and World War II. Change and tremendous growth began in the Jewish community when the Research Triangle Park was created in the 1960s. Companies like IBM, Burroughs Welcome, Becton Dickinson, Monsanto, and others changed the face of the Triangle and Raleigh, making it a tech research hub. Those merchants in downtown Raleigh in the 20s, 30s, and 40s could hardly have imagined what we see today. Um, our first stop will be Mordecai Historic Park. Mordecai Historic Park, which is part of the City of Raleigh's Historic Resources and Museums Program, preserves the home of Mor Moses Mordecai and his family, along with several other historic structures. This is the house where Moses Mordecai lived while he was in Raleigh. He came to Raleigh in 1807 and passed the bar exam and began practicing law. He married one of the sisters, one of the Lane sisters, whose family owned this house. He died in 1824, so he lived here from 1807 to 1824. You'll notice if you're familiar with Jewish names that my pronunciation is unusual. Jews generally would say Mordechai or Mordecai, but in Raleigh, the family has been known for years as Mordecai. Today's generation of the family says the pronunciation was changed to sound less Jewish. The name also sounds like it might be Sephardic, but in fact, the ancestors of Moses Mordecai were Ashkenazic and came from uh, Northern Europe. So they were very early, probably among the earliest Ashkenazic immigrants to the United States. The City Parks and Rec Department has tried very hard to uh, maintain it every year with plants that would have been grown during the era when she lived here. The house and grounds here are peaceful and lovely, just a few minutes walk from the State Capitol building. It is what remains of a plantation that extended for miles in every direction. The Lane and Mordecai families were slaveholding families. This unusual family tree of the people who lived at Mordecai House um, has a number of sections, one of which shows the enslaved people who lived here. Mostly it lists their first names, Last names were not necessarily recorded, even in the census, so we just have first names. These are Lane family enslaved persons on this side. 
And here's our Moses Mordecai, uh, born in 1785, died in 1824. This is his father, Jacob, who ran a school in Warrington, North Carolina. And this is Jacob's father, the first Moses, who is uh, the man who came to the United States uh, for the whole family. Moses married into the Lane family, and they are over here. Joel Lane is the man who, at whose tavern the city of Raleigh was founded. His son was Henry, and Henry had daughters named Anne, she was called Nancy, and Margaret, she was called Peggy. Moses Mordecai married Anne. She died after having two children. And then he married Peggy, and Peggy had one child. The Lane sisters were from a prominent family. It's not clear how and why the Jewish Mordecai was accepted into the Lane family. But there is no record of Moses' converting to Christianity, although the Lanes were founders and supporters of Christ Church in Raleigh. Let's move on to historic Oakwood Cemetery where the story of the Jewish community and the Mordecai family continues. This is the grave of Max Erlanger, uh, certainly the first in the Hebrew section, uh, the first or the second at Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, Max was a musician. He had been born in Bavaria. We don't know much about his travels in the United States, but he was living in Raleigh when he died. As often happens, the first institution that a Jewish community needs is a cemetery. And the Hebrew Cemetery Association came to George Washington Mordecai and asked if they could buy a small section of the new cemetery. He agreed to that. They paid $218.75 for this plot of land, about 125 feet by 35 feet. And Max is the first person buried here. Many people noted at the time of Max Erlanger's death that George Mordecai recognized his personal connection to the Jewish community in agreeing to sell land for a Hebrew section. George was a practicing Christian and a stalwart member of Christ Church on Capitol Square. These are the graves of Michael and Regina Grausman, and Michael Grausman was the original leader of Raleigh's Jewish community. He and his wife were born and married in Bavaria and came to the United States. Michael Grausman was really the first leader of the Raleigh Jewish community. And if you look at Temple Beth Or's history and if you look at Beth Meyer's history, um, you'll find that we both claim him as our founder. Um, he was born in, uh, again, one of the German states. He was well-educated. He was able to lead the prayers. He was able to talk about the Torah and the Talmud. And he was uh, the leader of the Jewish community. Many of the family names you see on the monuments here are gone from Raleigh. Rosenthal, two different families. Elias, Ettinger, Schwartz, Israel, Kaplan. They were very important in their day in the Jewish affairs of the city. Burials continued in this section until 1999. By 1912, the growing Jewish community decided it preferred owning its own cemetery. So they again purchased land, this time about two acres, and moved around the corner to Raleigh Hebrew Cemetery. To fund the purchase and maintenance of the new cemetery, families purchased family plots. Various sizes were available, 20 by 15 feet, 20 by 10 feet, 10 by 10 feet. The first funeral in 1914 was for Isaac Zillickson, only 48 years old, married to Annie and the father of eight children. His name is on the plaque at the entrance to the cemetery as one of the founders. His wife Annie had to figure out a way to support the family and she actually uh, had a luncheonette on what is now Moore Square in downtown Raleigh. But Ike, Ike was a very popular uh, citizen of Raleigh, and his funeral is described in the News and Observer in 1914. And uh, not only were the Masons there, because he was a member of um, the Masons and there was a Masonic service for him at Raleigh Hebrew Cemetery, 
but both streams of Judaism also participated in his funeral. And it's interesting to read the News and Observer's interpretation of the different streams of Judaism in that article. Over the years, the cemetery has been expanded twice, and in the next few years will be sold out. This cemetery contains the story of Raleigh's Jews from 1914 forward. The oldest section of Raleigh Hebrew Cemetery has the graves of the early merchants who settled in Raleigh. For the most part, they were merchants. In fact, I brought a friend here who was a historian who grew up in Wilson, and he looked at the various monuments and he said to me, Barbara, this is like coming to Raleigh on a Saturday after tobacco harvest and going shopping because he recognized so many of the names that he saw. Ellisburgs, Adlers, Neiman's, many other retail stores in downtown Raleigh where his family had shopped. Michael Grausman died in 1891, but by that time the Jewish community had actually shrunk a little bit. Some of the merchants had left town for larger cities like Baltimore, uh, which Baltimore was really the, um, the center of the universe for Southern Jews. Many of them had immigrated through Baltimore and had family in Baltimore. Um, and immigration had dropped off from the German states. But after 1905, the, the flood of immigrants began from the Pale of Settlement, from Ukraine, from Belarus, from Moldova, from Poland. And many of those folks ended up in Raleigh. Uh, Jewish people lived in all different neighborhoods in Raleigh. They lived in Boylan Heights and Cameron Park. Um, Raleigh had a very well, has a very well-known subdivision called Hayes Barton. Hayes Barton was not always available to Jewish persons who wanted to buy there because there was a restriction on some of the deeds. Some of the deeds require that the uh, properties be sold to Christian families. And this was pretty common, not just in Raleigh and not just in the South, but all over the United States. And until the courts ruled that they were unconstitutional, uh, some of these restricted neighborhoods uh, existed for a long time. This is East Lane Street in Raleigh's Victorian era suburb, Oakwood. So many Jewish families lived on East Lane Street that they referred to it as the Russian Front. In 1912 was an important year in the Jewish community. It split into two worship communities. Temple Beth Or chose affiliation with the Union of American Hebrew, Hebrew Congregations, or Reform Practice, Others chose a more traditional form of Judaism and formed the House of Jacob, a congregation which met in a house at 8 Southeast Street at Newburn Avenue. The rabbi lived at the house on the first floor and the congregation and the religious school met on the second floor. The House of Jacob was about a mile from the Hebrew Cemetery and many members of the congregation lived in Oakwood. Walking to Shul on Shabbos was not impossible. Unfortunately, we have not been able to find a picture of that house. No one seems to have one. We wish we did. The reform group was briefly called Raleigh Hebrew Congregation and then adopted the name Temple Bethor, which means House of Light as their name. Let's go downtown and see where Temple Bethor settled in 1912. When Temple Bethor was formed in 1912, it met on the second floor of this building, which had been built as a hotel, but in 1912 housed Rosenthal's grocery store. The congregation met there for 10 years before they built their own building on Hillsborough Street. This corner of Harkett Street and Wilmington Street was close to many of the businesses the Jews owned, and it was a prominent business address. Caddy Corner across the street was Goodman's, first a jewelry store owned by Oscar Goodman, and then a ladies' ready-to-wear store owned by his widow and daughter. Next to Goodman's were GNS Department Store and Pizer Brothers. A lot of uh, Raleigh's downtown businesses were owned by Jews, and sometimes uh, they put their name on the business. Uh, Goodman's Lady Shop, uh, Highly Levine Furniture, 
um, and Adler shoes, Ellisbergs, there were lots of those. But there were also some where uh, the merchants didn't really want their names on the businesses. Uh, Vogue, Men's Shop, GNS department stores, uh, uh, Dixie Pawn Shop, uh, Reliable Pawn Shop. Uh, they were a little bit more concerned about not having a Jewish name on a business. I think they were worried about two things. I think they were worried that people wouldn't want to deal with them because they were Jewish and um, maybe that they would be the targets for having their stores broken into or vandalized or damaged in some way. So uh, they kept their name off the business. In the early 20s, when Temple Beth Or had grown to the point where it needed a building of its own, it chose a site on Hillsborough Street in a block with beautiful homes and churches. The congregation raised money for the new building by selling sandwiches at lunchtime, as Raleigh had few restaurants then. Since 1978, Temple Beth Or has been in Northwest Raleigh on Creedmoor Road. This building on Hillsborough Street was torn down in the early 90s, leaving its neighbor the esteemed Char Grill Hamburger Stand to deal with the office buildings that came along in the 21st century. Imagine on Yom Kippur when you are not supposed to eat, having the delicious smells from the Char Grill waft into the sanctuary. It was, it was quite an adventure. In 2012, Temple Beth Or celebrated its 100th anniversary, and we had a lot of festivities that year, and we collected a lot of historical material. And some of the photographs that were on display for our centennial celebration are in this case. And I wanted to point out one in particular. This is a picture of our ark in the sanctuary in its original setting in 1867, in Temple Beth El in Detroit, Michigan. This is, the picture behind it is today at Temple Beth Or. But this means a lot to us because it indicates the continuity of the use of the Ark and our uh, happiness that the synagogue in Michigan let us uh, use the Ark. I am sitting in front of Temple Beth Or's Ark of the Covenant uh, the most prominent feature in our sanctuary and probably everybody's favorite. Um, it was originally made for a congregation in Detroit, a big congregation in downtown Detroit in 1867. In 1867, Detroit had enough people in a congregation to build this magnificent ark. And as far as we can tell in Raleigh, in 1867, there was Michael Grausman and his family, and maybe a handful of other Jewish people. This beautiful architectural gem was built in 1948. The congregation adopted the name Beth Meyer Synagogue, House of Meyer, in honor of a donor, Meyer Dworsky. Just as its predecessor, House of Jacob, had been named after a donor. Today, the congregation is affiliated with the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism. When Beth Meyer moved from St. Mary's Street to Newton Road, congregants walked and carried the Torah scrolls to the new location in a beautiful and moving ceremony. Since that time, this building has served as offices for a law firm and several nonprofit organizations. Beth Meyer was here until 1983 when it moved to Newton Road in North Raleigh. Today's Wake County Jewish community is larger and growing faster than anyone could have imagined. In addition to Beth Meyer Synagogue and Temple Beth Or, there are six other synagogues, Beth Sholem in Cary, Congregation Sharei Israel in Raleigh, Yavna in Raleigh, the Chabad Center in Cary, and the Chabad Center Young Professionals Group in downtown Raleigh. Hillel at NC State has two professionals and a permanent meeting place on Hillsborough Street. 
there are three Jewish preschools. The Jewish Federation of Raleigh Cary is busy and dynamic and includes the Jewish Family Services Agency and the Jewish Community Relations Council. The Federation also operates the JCC, including the David R. Kahn Community Center with athletic facilities and the location of kids' day camps. The North Carolina Museum of Art is home to one of the rare Judaica collections in a publicly owned museum. As Jewish Raleigh grows in depth and breadth, we remember our heritage as a community of immigrants struggling to make their way in a new country. We hope we can continue to be rewarded for our pursuit of the American dream.